we are totally crazy, you know? <laughs> wow. There's thousands and thousands and tens and tens of thousands of people doing this. Wow, okay, okay. So it's a race, though, right? Well, there's a race, and there's, you know, just to try and make it. It's 200 kilometers on ice skates. It'll hurt your feet after, man. you know, a few hundred meters. Oh, man. Brutal. And this was the this was really like Canadian winter circumstances. Uh-huh. So, mustaches oh. froze. <laughs> oh, <man>. <laughs> Welcome to the November 13th edition of The Electric View. I'm Neil Thompson. Today we have Jim, Edwin, Heather, Buddy, Robert, Eugene, and David. They are discussing the newly found dark matter hurricane, the solar system's Lagrange points and the properties of planetary orbits, and the ways of explaining these phenomena. Please like and subscribe below. This this is called Uh klunen. When they walk on the the irons, you have to walk a little uh, across a dike or whatever. Okay. <clears throat> so it's very awkward because you're walking on two iron bars, you know, sticking underneath your feet. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, we love this. This is If this were to happen again, the whole country would go crazy and I would watch it on telly. Wow. And uh, okay. there are hundreds of thousands of people that are already a uh, member for trying to participate because there's not nearly enough room. Uh-huh. Whenever. But they, you say they do it every 20 years? Or? So. Well, uh, only when the winter is strong enough. So strong, we, gotcha. in 56, gotcha. 86, we had two in a row, Okay. I think. <clears throat> but then, you know, 15 years afterwards, none. Uh-huh, uh-huh, gotcha. I'm not sure. When was the last one? Could have been 86, actually. Okay. God, Wild. See, global warming is real. Let's see, okay. So, and they are warning us that, you know, and now they're warning us that this com- this is coming back, Little Ice Age. We're going to freeze over. And the Dutch go like, yeah, man, I'll stay the talk. <laughs> huh. At least we'll have that one again. Right, right. Wow. So, I can do that stuff too, but not as good as they are. Not, not nearly as it's, strong as they are. It's brutal on your feet. Yeah, really. oh, brutal on your feet, your back. You know, you do this for six hours straight. Yeah. And it's fucking cold then, as you can see. Yeah. And it's all ice, so it's so beautiful to do this. Skating through that landscape, uh, over over the lakes, over the over the ponds and the canals where you normally you, you can't go, right? Uh-huh. uh-huh. Now you just float over it. Right, right. We used to have like so really nobody else heavy heavy, heavy weathers. Uh let's see. Let's see who's uh I know Jim's, Jim's on, right? Yeah, Jim is on. Jim is shy. Come yeah. on, Jim. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Hey, 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 there he is. Yeah. Let's talk electrons then, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That This uh, this paper that, that Jim shared today was pretty cool. But look at that helicopter. Okay. I need popping. Yeah, he was a hero. Oh, okay. So these were not professional people. Nowadays, there are more, more or less, lots of professional sporters. Uh huh. But usually, these are your regular farmer or carpenter or whatever. Right. And uh, they, most winters we could ice skate, not every winter. Mm-hmm. So most people pretty much knew pretty well how to skate. But we didn't have rollerblades yet, you know. It was only skating when it was cold enough. Right. So these people, they put on the skates, they practice for a couple of days, and they perform this race. I mean, this is like, you know, the old-fashioned way. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, awesome. So, so Jim, like, uh, shared shared this with me today, and uh, I was just, I was take, quicking, taking a quick scan at it. This is just within the last uh, 45 minutes to an hour or so. But uh, really interesting, particularly the... Uh, the image here. We're just gonna see. Yeah, this this uh, this action. This was this was particularly interesting to me. Do you have any insights into this, Jim? I don't. Well, how I got to that was looking up there. The news that's making the rounds is that there's supposedly this uh, dark matter hurricane or dark matter. Um, 
nano whipping through our part of the galaxy. Ooh. You've got to oh. explain this a little bit. I'm not sure what we're looking at. I knew it. <laughs> but but see what what they are seeing is that these well this the swirling of 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 stars around pretty much in our neighborhood. Uh-huh. But again, you can see that they're just looking at cross sections of like a a, a helical helical right. flow. Right. And the, the the density map is what's on the left in those images, and then the the motions what's on the map in the right. You can see the flow around in not circular, but like it, it doesn't. It, it's helical. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. I'm seeing. Like, but again, they I'm have seeing no like three arms on it. But I mean, just as far as the density goes. But but if, if you want to explain that by gravity, then you got to have dark matter to hold that thing together. So that right. There's got to be dark matter in the center of that. You know. Right. Down it's right. A dark matter tornado. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sharknado. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so uh, I mean, I you know did uh, did you. Check out that. Uh, I'll, I'll bring it up just because I, I find it interesting. I ran across the, to tie these in serendipitously. I, I ran across the you know the Lagrange points that we were talking about a little bit. Um, have you, the Hildas? Have you heard of the Hilda asteroids in uh, around uh, the the Jupiter uh, orbit at all? You know, there's there's two densities. Let me just bring this up and hopefully it'll run. Go go wide on it. Like here's Jupiter, and then here are these uh, focused areas of asteroids. But there's this group that that happens. Trojans, yeah, it's a Trojan group and stuff. They're yeah. really interesting. Yeah. And uh, so the, these are, the, the, I, I think these are the Trojans and these are the Greeks, and really those are the names. And then these are Hildas. <laughs> So, but if you look at the motion, it's really interesting because they kind of it's it, it has that uh, mermation kind of feel to it, but they they like they kind of come come in and they're they're attracted to this Lagrange point, and then they scoot off ahead, you know, because they're a little bit they're further in on the on the orbit, right? So. I hadn't seen it before, but it kind of caught my eye, and then I I, I took it and I put it in Premiere and and flipped the uh, uh, you know inverted the color on it so I could so you could see you know the movement. It's pretty interesting, though. Right? Yeah, that's that's cool. So yeah, so these are the these are the classic. Lagrange points, and you, you probably know more about this than than me. But it's it's, uh, it's uh, the, there's the, the moon, we have one with the moon. You know, it's it's this type of of uh, configuration that causes. You know, I guess I guess it's true of any orbiting uh, quote unquote mass. So, mm-hmm. Found an an interesting data collection on it. And just the movement of of the uh, these asteroids that they call Hilda's finding particularly interesting. So, I don't know if that's. And which one of those are called Hilda's? The green ones. Those that, the triangular. Green. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So was like I guess two Christmases ago, I was playing around with. Uh, you know the mermation videos of uh, starlings. I guess that it re- reminds me of those. Anyway, but of course, there's there's a murmuration, murmuration, murmuration. Yeah. Uh-huh. But it's interesting to see them. You know, you can see the accelerations that happen here, and then they, you know, they kind of flock into the Lagrange points. So. So, what what is the point you're trying to make? Is that should be related to just to maybe next... those you know cymatics? Yeah, I mean, before. I'm seeing yeah, I'm seeing Something a lot, like seeing a lot of things in there. 
Yeah, the, the, the Lagrange points are particularly interesting. I don't know what I, you know. I've 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 had a a, a just very kind of superficial exposure to orbital mechanics and that kind of stuff that you may you may lend some insight into into them you know so. yeah well those those uh purple asteroids that we saw at this diagram they're at l3 and l5 points i'm sorry l4 and l right yeah. right here uh so well well if you if you just if you just uh, solve the problem of what kind of potential gravitational potential would be at certain points with two bodies in this case so the sun and jupiter uh you would see that there are certain special points such as again those l4 and l5 where the potential uh, it's sort of flat so it's more or less stable points uh -huh. uh, although, uh, as you can see, uh, they're they're not exactly stable because you know the gravitational force uh, is outwards, uh, at least in some directions. Uh, you see these those triangles. Uh, so, but there are at least there is no uh, sort of long term influence if you are situated right in this area of say L four or L five. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have basically any system of two bodies have those points. Uh, for example, the Earth Moon system has them. And again, there was recently a paper where uh, that was describing the sort of dust that gathers in Earth Moon L4 and L5 points, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. And for example, L1 and L2 between Earth and Sun are the points where many of the satellites are stationed they are not exactly sitting there they they actually orbit around these points uh because because of well it's, a, it's a details of station keeping i guess mm -hmm. uh there are so called halo orbits around these points for example in l1 most of the stuff that observes the sun uh, in terms of you know collecting the solar wind data and so on the SOHO satellite is in L1. The uh, Discover, uh, Wind, Ace, all those guys are sitting at L1. And in L2, between Earth and Sun, actually kind of behind the Earth uh, with respect to the Sun, uh, are many of the satellites that need to be shielded from the Sun. Mm -hmm. And so kind of Earth's shadow helps to achieve that. Uh, and some of the telescopes, I believe, are there. Uh, the Planck satellite, maybe you remember that one, that was studying the, again, supposedly cosmic microwave background uh -huh. and so on. The, 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 the James Webb telescope is, is planned to be put in L2 uh, uh, okay. and so on. Okay. So it's it's and, kind of uh, like a it's kind of like a well that sits there. Like I mean, the the thing that I'm getting as far as an analogy is like like you're drifting behind. Like when you like, there's a trick for skateboarders used to do this, but they would get behind a truck, and there's there'd be a place where there's kind of a well that you could sit in, and you could you're, yeah you're kind of drafting, so you're kind of drafting, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And what is good about it is when you're sitting at L two or L one, for example, your relative position to both these objects in Earth and Sun, for example, does not change. So they always stay relatively to you at the same spots, you know. So you, so you kind of orbit the sun with the Earth, but with respect to Earth and sun, you stay at the same spot mm -hmm. on the same line. And the same is true for other points such as L4, L5, and L3. Right, right, uh, right. So that's why these asteroids, they kind of look like, like they, you know, orbit the sun together with Jupiter, like they're connected to it in some way well they are actually they are connected at least by gravitation i mean uh, of course you might say it's not maybe not exactly gravitation but uh newtonian mechanics pretty much describes this effect mm -hmm. very well mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't see any problems with that exactly i wonder what the the, the ratio between these two i find pretty interesting yeah. L1 uh, and L2. I, 
yeah, well, it's kind of, mm, you know, at L2, and both those bodies uh, kind of attract you in, in the same direction. Both Earth and Sun's gravity acts to basically drag you towards the sun. Uh -huh. Whereas in L1, it's, it's like Earth's gravity counteracts right. partially the solar gravity. So it would be closer to the Earth because, uh, well, because it, it's, uh, it sub subtracts rather than adds. Uh huh. Uh huh. You know what I mean? Right. So at L2, effectively, you're kind of orbiting both Earth and Sun together. And so the gravity is a, a bit stronger there in the sense that uh, you can go in higher orbit with the same period. See? So with the same period as Earth, I mean. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Because Earth itself adds to, to the so solar attraction. Uh -huh. And then, are there are there other Lagrange points that I mean that are that are less pronounced than these? This is, no, I don't think so. I, don't, I think there are only the, five. Okay. Uh, yeah, and well, it's a two body problem. So if you had only two bodies, such as Earth, Sun, uh, or Sun and Jupiter, you would have five. But if you have three bodies, well, actually. I'm not even sure that Lagrange points would exist. So if you add the moon, for example, here, or Venus, uh, I think it would all be screwed up. Uh, I mean, well, there's a, there's, a dub, there's a doubling here, though, because there's, the moon is, the moon would be playing, it would be affecting these, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. In real life, you have to account for that, for, for the influence of the moon and other planets and so on. Right. Uh, yeah, but, but, but in this very simplified, problem with only two bodies uh, you can have those mm -hmm. and uh, again we don't have an analytical solution the exact solution for three bodies uh, uh, the exact solution in Newtonian dynamics uh -huh. in Newtonian gravitation so uh, you can only numerically uh, approximate something and, and and that's what people do actually they basically uh, use various approximations and uh, what is called patched conics approach, if you have heard about it, where conics means conical sections, right. such as ellipses, hyperboles, parabolas. Right. So they use one approximation. Uh, for example, it's frequently used in the sp space flight in, when you're planning missions to other planets, for example. So you use the approximation of elliptical orbit around the Earth, but then uh, when your spacecraft accelerates to, uh, for, to leave the Earth's gravity, uh, you use the, the parabolic or hyperbolic <laughs> orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you kind of uh, tie it together with another ellipse, which is its orbit around the sun when uh -huh. it's going to leave Earth. Right. And then you tie it together to its hyperbolic orbit around the planet that you're going to when you're going to enter its what is called sphere of influence. Right. So right. And so on. So they basically use these very simple, you know, uh, that's really interesting. more or less really interesting. more or less exact solutions. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, and it's uh, what, what, what do you think about what I'm sorry, I just this something fire. Yeah, I just my... I just wanted to right. add that sure. it's only Newtonian Newtonian gravitation, so nobody's talking about you know general relativity mm -hmm. effects because e even even simple Newtonian dynamics uh, is so uh, is so approximate in the sense that uh, how we use it, you know that the, those effects from relativity are, aren't even considered because. Uh -huh. It's just we just c c cannot even deal with regular Newtonian dynamics at this point. Okay, right, right. Well, it's a, you're mapping it onto by using a conic, you're mapping it onto a Cartesian grid, right? By yeah, obviously. yeah, obviously. obviously. So, so I mean, I'll just I'll just pause it because I like to invert things. It's like if you if you were to do it the opposite direction, where where instead of mapping it onto the Cartesian, it's like have the entire transformation, the conic transformation, all the time, you know, and, and have the conic transformation be changing, you know, instead of instead of being like your 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 grade 
always being that that uh, Euclidean Cartesian space. It's like have the space change. If you know what I'm, you kind of get the direction I'm pointing. Maybe not. It's a, it's it, it's it's a little out. It's turning it up. It's turning it in, inverting it. That's all. That's all. So. Are you still there? I may have lost you. And uh, it, it, playing around, I'm playing around with this uh, uh, hyperbolic geometry, and it, it points in that direction. At least that's why. That's kind of why I'm putting it on the table a little. But uh, yeah, it's really really interesting though. It's like a kite. So, get you back yet? Not yet. We got everyone muted. I'm, I'm alone. I need to do a monologue here. I guess. Oh, there we go. Okay. Are you back, Yuchi? Uh, I had to. Yeah, I had to go to the kitchen for a minute. Oh, no problem. No problem. So, uh. Yeah, did you ask me something? Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering. You said I, about inverting something, but then I, then I disappeared. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just I was wondering. But you know, you're talking about the approximations and how the, how the you kind of have to in or, in order to get something that's workable, you have to make approximations, etc. So I was, I was just saying, another potential way of approaching it is to have like a, a, a active flowing transformation going. You know, where and I'm the reason I'm saying this is I've been looking at this uh, universal hyperbolic geometry, where you 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 could theoretically take your conic and have it be, have the conic be changing as as you move along you know you might have a reference a cartesian reference but you could have the geometry itself the the re the reference geometry dynamic as a transformation but that might be too exotic yeah um, okay i actually thought it would you were saying something about, along the lines of, you know, this again, Stephen Wolfram's new, new kind of, you know, science. Like, oh, yeah, like, no. like, like you're, uh -huh. you're, you, you have basically an algorithm that constantly gives you some output. Uh, in this case, for example, the gravitational force or whatever, uh, with the, the given input, when you don't even, you know, work with the equations themselves, it just kind of keeps pumping back and forth the, the input and output or something like uh, that. Uh -huh. but, but actually, your idea about the geometry is pretty interesting. I'm not even sure if, if anybody did, ever did that. Uh, I mean, I'm just to, trying, to, yeah. trying to describe the orbital mechanics in, in, not in Cartesian sense. Well, you can obviously use like polar core coordinates or something like that, but I believe that uh, what you're calling hyperbolic geometry is something different. Probably, right? It's a little bit. It's more general, I would say, a little bit. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I mean, it's 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 interesting because it's conics. You know, it's looking at it's looking at things as conics. And uh, uh, anyway, I'm 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 just starting to scratch the surface on it. But if if it, it feels really interesting, and and I like I I like the guy who's a proponent of it. He's got a pretty nice background. Uh -huh. so. Well, uh, again, it's the consequence of Newtonian dynamics that are uh, what initially was actually proposed as a uh, axiom, I believe, like the Keplerian law that planets move in ellipses, right? Uh -huh. uh, but Newton uh, kind of enlarged that picture to the case of uh, non-periodic orbits also. I'm not sure if he himself talked about that, but uh, technically what follows from his work is that there are also non-periodic orbits, such as parabolas and hyperbolas. Right. Uh, and uh, but but all of them, ellipses, parabolas, and hyperbolas are uh, conic sections. Right. So that's and why they behave they in similar it. in Keplerian ways, right? Yes. Just yes. As far as, the, so, as far as like the velocity, the areas. Uh, uh, yeah. Actually, yeah. actually, what's what's interesting, uh, and it's it's noted by Feynman in one of his lectures that. Uh, the orbits themselves, uh, uh, kind of the ellipse, the trajectory look like ellipse, but also if you map the, all the velocities, the, the vectors of, of speed of a planet, uh, along its orbit, and not only a planet, I mean, anybody, uh, in, in, in any body, 
in this system, you would have also an ellipse. So uh, all the velocity vectors, uh, if you kind of put put them from, if you draw them from a single point, uh, uh, their ends would draw an ellipse. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a very interesting thing. So so th there there's indeed some sort of reciprocity, I guess. Right. You know, right. Uh, between between the trajectory and the velocity. So maybe there is some way to build some sort of geometry, you know, starting from this re reciprocity. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of, you know, we have this point of, of similarity of, of these two spaces, essentially, the velocity space and co coordinate space. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can use that as, as a point of departure and, and do something with it. But I, I have no idea at this point. It's just an intuitive I idea. Basically. Right, right. Yeah, it's really interesting. That whole uh, one of the things that Jim kind of kind of brought up that I find you know is talk, talking about the orbits of the planets etc. But the uh, I guess it's uh, the eccentricities, but particularly like at Pluto's eccentricity is pretty striking when you start play, playing around with the I, I I had the opportunity to work on Jim's stuff a bit and when you get in there and you you're actually visualizing it. It becomes really, really kind of striking how how, how that's that slope. Right? That's that's what's called, right? So you, no, it's not the eccentricity. It's it's the uh, the uh, inclination. Inclination. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. The, well, the relationship between the two that that, that you get, mm -hmm. and that and that does come from a Bessel. If you put things in a Bessel function filament, that you you're forced with that relationship, basically. Uh, but you know, for example, the uh, when you're talking about the inclination, uh, you have to choose a reference plane with with respect to which plane you're, right. you're, are you measuring the right, inclination. Right. And, yeah. and and actually, it's it's kind of interesting that most of the time we do it with respect to the ecliptic, that is the plane of Earth's orbit, uh, and then the inclinations would be not very big, like maybe a couple of degrees. Of at least most of the planets, uh, but if you compare the Earth's orbit itself with the Sun, for example, then we have a well, with the plane of solar equator, for example, we would have a pretty pretty inclined orbit. Our, our orbit is inclined with respect to the solar equator at seven degrees or so. So we're kind of constantly going up and down with respect to the uh, z zero latitude at the sun. Uh -huh. And it actually drives some seasonal effects, for example, the, the geomagnetic effects. Uh, well, at least it's one of the factors. There are various hypotheses on, on, the, on this. Uh, uh, so in, in the uh, autumn and spring, we have more higher geomagnetic activity uh, because we are in autumn uh maybe like in the beginning of october or something like that we are at the highest point at the northernmost po point of our orbit with respect to the solar equator okay. so the sun kind of effectively it means the sun is kind of a little bit tilts a little bit with it with its northern pole towards us you know uh -huh. because because we are very far north well not very far but 7 degrees uh, and then uh, around winter solstice, or maybe a month later or something like that, we are almost at the equator of the sun. And then in spring, we are at the southernmost point of our orbit. So the sun kind of tilts with its southern pole towards us. And of uh, course, since these polar areas are often, they often contain those coronal holes that you know, uh, shoot out the fast solar wind. Uh, so in spring and autumn, we, we receive more of this fast solar wind than we do in other times of years. This is one of the factors that is driving the higher geomagnetic activity uh, in autumn and spring. But there is also a tilt of Earth's axis, uh, Earth's spin axis, which is, well, n not the spin itself, but the, our magnetic dipole. So again, we actually talked about it once. Right. I remember that, but 
Right. Uh, so in in summer uh, or in winter, we are tilted towards the sun with one of the poles. That that's why we have summer or winter because, for example, in northern hemisphere summer, the northern pole is tilted towards the sun, so so the sun doesn't even set at the northern pole, right? Mm -hmm. It has po polar right. day and stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, the, and that's the same is half a year later when you have this summer in su southern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, during the uh, uh, in autumn and fall, oh, I'm sorry, autumn and spring, uh, the Earth is moving uh, along its orbit. So, so that this tilt of the magnetic uh, axis of Earth is slightly, at least, there is a component of it which coincides with the direction of Earth's motion, right? A tangential component because mm -hmm. of this tilt. And so we kind of uh, hit the solar plasma head on, so to speak. Okay. And so... So more of it gets uh, into the polar areas. Actually, it's, it's pretty interesting that uh, the solar wind is not falling to us right right from the sun. It falls falls onto the Earth at almost like 45 degrees angle. Uh, so if you look at the sun, uh, it's not where, where the solar wind is coming from right now at us. Uh, it's actually 45 degrees to the right, if you're looking from the North Pole, uh -huh. uh, because because the sun rotates and this causes this curvature of solar of streams of solar plasma. Right, right, right. Uh, and so when we are uh, one of the poles of Earth is coincides with our direction of motion, uh, the, this component of the solar wind, which is parallel to our motion, is much much uh, gives more, much pr more pronounced effect on our magnetosphere. So the plasma is uh, here for it to penetrate, you know, the magnetosphere to fall in these uh, magnetospheric cusps at the poles and cause the auroral mm -hmm. uh, 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 borealis uh, and also the magnetic storm. Oops, that was, uh, let's see if I get this right. Yeah. That that again looked like like a monologue. <laughs> that was great. That was awesome. It's it's it's. Uh, okay. So th this is this is what you're talking about. Right? Uh, well, this is the current sheet, but it's it's kind of not exactly what I'm not talking exactly. about. Not exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's, it doesn't show what I was talking about. But these pictures oh, with with spirals. Uh -huh. That's what I'm referring to. No. No. Again, this is a different one. The, the 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 solar more like, uh, more like this right yes yes exactly so uh -huh. so these are the the streams of the solar wind and and as you can see where Earth is they are very very curved already uh -huh. and actually for the outermost planets such as Neptune for example the solar wind would actually fall onto Neptune almost like from the front mm -hmm. right for, right where it's going in its orbit. Not from the sun at all, but at almost ninety degrees angle to it. And it's, it's pretty interesting. So, what, what but uh, what, where we are, it's uh, again forty-five degrees or so. Mm -hmm. So, what what affects like just it's because of yeah, what, for instance, like Venus because of its its uh, the axis, the ang angle of the axis. Do, do you see like a significant difference in the effect on the, the surface of Venus because of that? Well, first of all, it's actually spinning in the other directions. So almost like, you know, uh, how do yeah, you call it? Yeah. upside down. Upside basically. down, right, right. Uh, and secondly, it doesn't have a magnetosphere. Uh, so so okay so it's closer to the sun than we are so this this means that this angle is less than 45 degrees for venus it's maybe 30 i'm not sure uh maybe maybe 35 or maybe 25 or something like that so uh so the the solar wind is 
coming more kind of from the direction closer to the sun rather than closer to the uh, direction of its motion in its orbit. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, the, the key factor here is that Venus doesn't have a magnetic dipole like we do, or like Mercury does, actually. Uh, so uh, the solar wind can, uh, can directly fall in onto the atmosphere. Uh, and it, again, it, it, it's, it's what, uh, what creates this uh, prominent cometry-like behavior, basically. You know, this, uh, well, comets, for example, also do, do not have magnetic fields of their own, at least any significant ones. So that's why we see all those peculiar effects, those jets and so on. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, EU has their own interpretation of, but uh, uh, even even mainstream acknowledges that this is what what the, the interactions of solar plasma with uh, water or whatever else that is emitted for, by the comet is what creates those those peculiar effects. So something like that is observed with Venus also. And as you probably remember, there was a paper how. You know, the, this tail of ions from Venus that is blown off by the solar wind and solar radiation, it's so long that it actually can reach Earth. Right. And we can, can detect it. Uh, so, yeah, but, but if it had a magnetic field, uh, it, it wouldn't happen, at least not to that degree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that I, how do they measure that when that, when that comes off? I mean, they can... Obviously, they're they're sensing uh, sensing that it's there, uh, but well, this particular article that I'm referencing, it's uh, it was about SOHO satellite that we actually talked about a bit earlier that sits in L1, Earth okay. Sun Lagrange point. So it just just literally caught these ions. Uh, there was uh, I remember exactly there was oxygen and maybe carbon. Uh, so those are probably the products of disintegration of CO2, which is very, Venus atmosphere is very rich with CO2. So the, I'm not sure how exactly they determined that it was from Venus, but I don't, I just think that, well, the, 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 there was no other reason, you know, for it to be there since, since it's coincided with the conjunction of Venus. So uh -huh. right. I don't think there was any, any questions about it. Right, right, gotcha. And then, and then, like, like uh, Uranus with the with the pole pointing. I mean, you, you you see it with both Pluto and Uranus, where the where where the the axis of rotation is is so uh, is, you know off 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 vertical. What, yeah. Do, do like what what effects do you see on the uh, the you know on on the on the on the facing facing uh, pole? Is there is there a, is there a variation there that that you would, uh, that from like other planets in general? Yeah, yeah. I actually remember a paper from maybe a, a year ago by NASA how Uranus uh, magnetic field is very strange. Well, it's not only the the axis of rotation of the planet is very tilted, like ninety five degrees or something like that. So it's almost like rolling rather than right. You know, Right. Standing upright and uh, spinning. Uh, and not only that, but also its magnetic axis is very skewed. It's not even, it not even goes through the center of the planet, I believe. Oh, okay. Oh, so it's like, so it's, it's, it's not axial, huh? From the data we have. Because uh it's sort of axial so it's like a dipole but it's just put in some random place you know of wow, the okay. planet uh there's a pretty good show. Okay, I, lo I lost you there well there's well yeah i actually don't don't see a good, good picture of it but anyway uh so that there are pretty interesting effects caused by this for example it's a uh, uh, the article that I'm referencing to was mentioning that us are like constantly switched on and off because of this peculiar orientation of the axis of magnetic dipole on Uranus. 
Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, this this first. Uh huh. Wow. Okay. So you can see that it's not even it not even goes through the center of it doesn't even go through the center of wow. the planet. Okay. Yeah, the magnetic axis. Yeah. So it's really weird and. Uh, Does it wobble? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so, but but I don't know. We we don't have a history of observations of it, you know, mm-hmm. because uh, the only spacecraft that ever visited Uranus was, I believe, Voyager two, okay, uh, or maybe Voyager one, but only one of them actually visited this planet. So uh, we only have data from this spacecraft, and we also have some, you know. Uh, data from telescopes, which obviously cannot measure the magnetic field. They can only observe auroras uh, at best. Uh, and I'm not even sure if the orientation of the planet is, is favorable, you know, to, to do that. Mm-hmm. Because uh, as you imagine, uh, like if, if the year on Uranus is like maybe 100 years on Earth, I'm not sure about that also, but something like that was uh, maybe 80 years. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's possible that like we haven't even seen some parts of, of the planet yet. Uh huh. Right. right. I, I mean, it was discovered in like late 18th century. So, so people had enough resolution to actually see anything there. To see, you know, a bright spot back then in uh-huh. the sky that was moving. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, that's, that's really interesting that, that, that it's so far off. Very cool. What do you think, Jim? Jim, you there? <laughs> I always I always refer to Jim on 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 uh, solar system issues, but I think we may have lost them. So. Yeah. Well, one one of the things that was in that uh, diagram too that it would only showed up for it was only obvious in the case of. Uh, Pluto, but the, the way that the axes are tilted compared to the uh, the major axis of the orbit, that's that's an important point. Right. To the, that's true for pretty much all the planets. So, I deal with it. It's, you know, supposedly just a coincidence of the the era we live in, but it's it's but mechanism. There's a mechanism you, for that too. So, uh, can you can you explicitly state what you mean? Uh, the the coincidence of what with what? Well, the the solstice points with like perihelion points, they're they're pretty close. Like Earth Earth hits sol- winter solstice in the northern hemisphere in you know December, the end of December, and then early in January. Um, we hit perihelion. So, in other words, Earth's north pole is tilted towards um, when Earth is closest to the sun, Earth's north pole is tilted um, um, then basically how it works in the orbit is that the planet's north pole, and this is true for Mars too, is um, that it's you can think of it as being tilted towards a constant radius. Like Venus doesn't change much in radius. It's a very circular orbit. So its pole is pointed straight up and down. In other words, if you would, if, if current really does come through the solar system, that's what you would expect is you would expect, um, an object at a constant radius to be getting current from that shell and it would be aligned with the shell. Whereas a planet that's moving in or out will should have its po- the, one of its poles tilted towards that, always towards that shell. That's, I mean that that's that's kind of like an implication again of the, the model that Donald Scott was was trying to show. If our, if our whole solar system is strung on a filament, all these weird dynamics all of a sudden make sense. Like. Um, like the inclination versus eccentricity makes sense if you think of a I mean in this picture it's easiest to start with the static model even though we know that we'd be traveling along a filament if you just 
take a static model where there's a filament running up and down through there, you can see that then in that case, all these circular orbits would be out at a constant radius where the magnetic field is wrapped around and then they would be in minimum energy configuration orbits. But for a planet that wanders in and out, the magnetic field is going to have to point upwards or downwards as you move in or, in or out. And, and that would explain why planets have, orbits have to be inclined as they become more, more elliptical. In other words, like what you can visualize Pluto doing is crossing. Imagine Neptune circling around where the magnetic field is wrapped around the solar system. Then Pluto is, the magnetic field is pointed downwards where Pluto goes in. And at the other end of the orbit, the magnetic field must be pointed up. And then that's a minimum energy configuration for that orbit. But you can work that out from the Bessel function model is that a change in radius always leads to a more or less ax axial magnetic field direction. And then you can explain the orbits that way. Yeah, actually, I actually think, I actually think that I see what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. You can even draw that. If you just draw a nice picture of, you can see that that's, you're, you're, you're for, you're for. We're losing you a little bit. Too. If you use Don's model. Okay. Yeah. If you use Don's model, you see that it even explains the direction of, of, of which way it should be. You can, in other words, it says that the perihelion should be below the ecliptic plane as opposed to above, just as it actually is. In other words, it's, it fits the the direction that the magnetic field winds in his model as you move radially in or outward. So it works for it works if we're moving along along the filament too. It's just easier to visualize if you imagine it on a statically on a filament. So then then the planets would be the planets in circular orbits then would be where the field is exactly as Muthel. Now, it works for the helical version, too. It just means that the planets would be a constant radius would mean a constant helical path. And then as you move in or out, what Pluto would really be doing is kind of racing ahead where the, where the field is more axial, it would be racing ahead and then where the field is more as Muthel would be cutting around the filament so again that's hard it's it's easier to see with a with when david did that we did the i mean the, i could i could put it 3D. on if you want to look at it yeah it i don't know, it I don't more, know if that's if, if you're ready for a demo <laughs> yeah i'm having a hard time following if you will is it well see like if again like, i actually I actually understood it. I think I think yeah, I'm kind of, I, I get it a little bit, but I'm, I'm familiar with it. But uh -huh. but uh, should I should I do that? Yes. Yeah, so you, you, yeah. so you could. I'll go. I'll go you in could, and see if we. You could, please please talk as as I try to do this, but I'll I'll, I'll make an attempt anyway. Okay, I come back. I was looking at the water bridge here. That's where that's where I got got to kind of cut off there. I'll come back to that. Let's see. Uh, yeah. So this is what you were talking about, Jim, right? Right. Yeah. So uh, that's about. Do you ever read? Do you ever read on that, Eugene, at all? Like what's 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 happening with with this, and then how it might relate to a Berkman curve. There's actually a talk by Bob Johnson about Water Bridge. Mm -hmm. He's he's very interesting. We we have a contact with him, so uh, we could uh, potentially be before the uh, be before the holidays uh, get him on. So it would be good to uh, to kind of prepare. I think prepare some questions for him because he's certainly got a. a uh, well, is that what 
is that water bridge the same effect that's happening in those um, experiments that you're changing the colors of for David Brown? Remember I was asking you about the horizontal connection between the two downward connections that was developing and sometimes you couldn't see it because I, it was it glow mode. What's, what's happening? Are they sharing charge? Are they growing together? Is it, is it the same thing as that's happening with those that's happening in a water bridge? In, in like, in, in Dave Brown's uh, images? In the images you, right. you filter through, but I've seen right. it several times because I filter images just like that. And I've, I've been asking about that and wondering about that. What is causing that? What's happening there when that happens? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, we can come, I'll, I'll bring those up to see if we can see them a bit. I think I may be having internet. A, a so, I don't know. Um, Do you think it's the fires, David, that's affecting your internet? Like, it's California? Oh, it could, yeah. I'm like yeah. a... It, very, very, super, I, yeah, super poss <laughs> possibly. Yeah, if I go away, you know, you'll know what happened. But just, just uh, <laughs> in the middle of a fire. Just don't go to Malibu. <laughs> Be safe. Right. So, uh, yeah, they're still coming up here, but these these are some of the variations that I I found in, in uh, Dave Brown's experiments. Okay. It's still loading. A few, a few of them. I'm be honest with you. I'm driving right now, so I cannot like tell you to go up or down or find. No problem. I, no I can't problem. Play that right now. We're having, we're, we're having a little bit of, a little bit of, uh, uh, of, of data passage. We're having our own water bridge problem here today, I think. So. But it's, it's, it's working somewhat. Yeah. 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 Which one's that one? Uh, hold on. Go back up there. This one? Right there. Well, the one above it. The one above Yeah, right there. Uh -huh. That one. Which one is that one? I mean, is that just fil different filters or? Yeah. I'm not, I was playing with, okay. I, I was actually putting, but playing with shaders and, and unity it's like it's kind of like extended photoshop filters that you can do in, in unity i got a whole set of them so okay Just, so that should actually yeah go out patterns if it was like to actually go into be, it's, in it's enhancing it's enhancing right it's an, it's yeah. enhancing you know what's going on actually with the original you know from it's, it's it's a frame out of his video, and then I'm I'm just lo looking at oh, the yeah. variations, you know, try, trying to enhance any type of variation that's yeah, happening. Like that. Yeah, I like so, what you're doing. Right, you kind of see. I mean, you see it here. That one's kind of cool. Right? You can show off so, and you can part. definitely see the the vortex type of action in it. You know, as like here, you can see. Yeah. So back to the water bridge. Yeah. So is it a similar effect? I, I I was listening to Gerald Pollack last night, and he was talking about you know the, the fourth state of water, et cetera, but that surface tension aspect of it with the you know the distribution of charge, and then this this uh, uh, hexagonal lattice that forms. You know. Well, I like to think about the surface tension of Berkeley currents um, because in, on some sort of electromagnetic wave, uh, some types of electromagnetic waves. So I'm interested uh, if Jim might know anything about surface tension and why planets and stuff lay right where they do on the Berkeley currents filaments. It's, what's what's the question? Why they would there be would there be surface? I, I might I'm going to dive in. Types and see, of see. types of surface tension, like a, a helical type of tension. You know, could there could there be could there be like like uh, layers of tension between where you get the sh you get the the polarity shifts in the uh, in a Birkeland current? 
Is that po- is that possible? I mean, I, I may be jumping too far with 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 Buddy's query, but it may pull it together. Well, whether there's like because because of that because of that boundary where there's a where there's a, a, a pol, pol, polarity switch, could there be some type of some type of surface tension there? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure, really. So, to me, it no. makes sense that 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 there is um, right where the two layers go against each other, um, where they switch. This is why there's two layers. Is because there's nothing but tension from both sides that, that push like winds, crosswinds, and create a stillness almost point. Um, and that would be one of the layers, and then there would switch counter rotation on the next ro- uh, layer. Yeah, I actually think that this water bridge it also has a cross sectionally speaking a structure from at least two parts. Like there is a core, and there is the what is annulus, the outermost part. And I I actually think that they are counter rotating. Like the core spins in one direction and the annulus in the other direction, but I'm not sure about that. It is I, so the, the annulus is the outer. What's the inner? Yes, the core. The, the core. Okay, because yeah. I've been so referring to it. It's as... basically a, a, a cylinder, and the annulus is like a hollow cylinder around it. You know, uh, sort of. So again, in this Bercon current approach, it's uh, it's something to be expected that they would be counter rotating, right? It seems you could get in there and determine that, right? Yeah, but I'm actually not sure if if these experiments are done in AC or DC. That's another question that I have, but. <laughs> I mean, my maybe impression it's is old. it's DC, but I don't know. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, that's so how they, they do it. They just have a you have pretty much constant current through it. Well, yeah, but con- that, constant that, voltage, sorry. Yeah, but I mean, the it, the water levels do not change. So basically what what flows in through the core flows out uh-huh. through the annulus basically i think so please but i might be wrong again so this this brings me back to the idea of a gradation model of Birkeland currents a scale model working that we could work off of that goes all the way subatomic to um you know uh, interstellar between uh, body to body uh, you know you guys see what I'm saying like we need a graph we need something that maps these out from the micro to the macro yeah well you know there's this idea of uh, triple jump I guess it's called it's from the plasma cosmology by Peratt and Alpine and, and others uh, the, the triple jump in scale again like you know for, from the uh, elementary particles to the I don't know actually what what is the next job so to speak but but, but they are like in ten to the ninth scale jumps or or something like that maybe ten to the sixth so and so the next uh, the, the the last step is basically cosmological structures uh, but yeah the, this is the idea from plasma cosmology about this scalability of the universe and yeah so so maybe maybe really derive some sort of properties of vertical and current repeat themselves uh regardless of the scale in the sense that the the, the same patterns are observed in on atomic level and on galactic and even you know universal level so to speak and that makes me think about uh, the Planck scale 
and how we add the Planck scale. And maybe we start with the radius of a hydrogen atom. I mean, but that sounds like Nessim Harriman. But, you know, ultimately, uh, that's clearly the direction that, that we're going. Did you see what they're getting there? That's pretty interesting. They're using x-rays. I'll share this paper. I just, you know, just searching around, of course. Very interesting, definitely. I lose you guys again. No, I'm still here. All right, I'm here. Cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, this is what I was talking about. Okay. Okay. So these are right, you know, different right, scales right, right. of plasma. This is definitely the, the definitely. I mean, this is what's in the air these days. You know, Jim, Jim was my my uh, in, introducer, you know, mentor through. But it's certainly certainly the song that's singing strongly in my head. Yeah, but this is from Peratt's book, I believe. Sure, uh, right. Physics of the Plasma Universe. Right, so. right. I'm still a newbie, you know. So. You can only have spiraling up to a certain rate, and it before those forces overcome. So that's that's what determines the the radius where that will fail, basically. Uh -huh. Okay. You know, speaking about the infinities, that's not not exactly related, but somewhat, I believe. So, uh, you know, I've been talking about the problems of cl classical mechanics, like Newton and stuff, but even in you know, classical electrostatics, there are also similar problems. In particular, uh, again, if, if you look at the electric field of a single particle, like an electric field of an electron, uh, you would see that the uh, the energy of this field, or, or the electric potential, if you like, of this field, it falls off as 1 over r, right? Where r is the distance from the electron. And which means that if you are infinitely close to the electron, where R is almost zero, you have almost infinite electric en energy mm -hmm. right. <laughs> just from one electron. <laughs> right. It's just kind of that one over R. Goes. Yeah, this is a yeah. This, I mean, this is a, a to me, it's a, a cornerstone like thing that that screams out at me when I was doing the the model for Jim. It's like. Well, you know, the, the sun, of course it is, because you've got all this, this angular momentum increasing through the roof as you get it towards the, towards r small radiuses, you know, of, of, of any of these orbiting situations. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so the, the point I'm making is that uh, uh, those theories really work only under certain very carefully checked conditions, so to speak. Uh -huh. uh, and whenever somebody says that, oh, you know, know everything about electromagnetism or gravity or whatever, well, to me, that does not ring true at all. In fact, say that we know very, very little and, you know, we can solve only these very basic problems that are you know, especially constructed in such a way they would be solvable. Right, but, right. Uh, well, the, in, in real life, the stuff behaves differently, right, usually. Right, I mean, the thing that I find is the problem is we've we've taken, like, the model that we use to map onto what's readily observable through, by, you know, empirically, but the model becomes, like, the definition of what it is rather than Okay, this is, it's like what it is is actually more, uh, 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 of a mystery. Here's, here's one way that we can, we can roughly approximate it, you know, and it's always that, right? Ultimately, it's that new, 
the phenomenon versus the 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 noumena, like what 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 we can sense it is versus what it actually is.